No one Irishman is as well known around the world as this Dubliner. A man so talented and successful, almost 100,000 people a night show up just to hear him sing. That's 3.2 million people in six months of touring. Just as importantly, there are as many million people alive today in Africa because of him. It's that balancing act between being a rock star and a humanitarian that makes him who he is. And who he is, is Bono. There are millions of people who can't name one of his songs, but whose lives have been touched by him. Not because he's a great singer or a great songwriter or a great rock star. Around the world, people have been affected by Bono because he's a great man. And that's why I feel that you should be voting Bono as Ireland's greatest. In Ireland, we do often have that kind of begrudging attitude towards Bono, if that's the right way to put it. I mean, he may be a jumped-up, mouthy rock star, but he is our jumped-up, mouthy rock star. We all know there's something fundamentally great about Bono. I mean, after all, you did put him into the top five. I genuinely do admire the guy. I mean, it is easy to dismiss the guy. I mean, see everything that he does, all the projects as a vanity one here or an egocentric one there, whatever. But I genuinely do not believe that Bono was trying to make the world better for him. He's genuinely trying to make the world better for everybody else. I mean, he could just stay in bed in the morning, you know, roll over, two fingers for the world, and all the rest of it. He doesn't do that. He gets up and does things. And for that, I really do admire him. When you have this single pressed and released and in your hands, whether it be a success or not in Ireland, what do you think you're going to do? Well, uh, with the single, I'm, I'm just going to keep it. I'm going to stick it on my wall, and that, that's really all I'm going to do. It was here, in this very studio, that Bono gave me his first interview in RT, and that's more than 30 years ago. With any luck, if there's anyone out there who wants to spend an awful lot of money to um, have the talents of the band U2 on record, well, then they'll offer us a certain amount of money, and uh, we'll sign our little signatures on it. I mean, in the interview that we did there from 1979, 31 years ago, he comes across as an idealistic, ambitious, Northside Dublin teenager. And now, I mean, you know, he's transcended music, he's transcended Ireland, and he's become more global than you could ever possibly imagine any Irish man to be. <laughs> At any one given time, he can be generous, pretentious, he can be annoying, he can be energetic, he can be impulsive, impatient, all of these things, maybe even at once. As uh, Edge put it once, he said, oh, yeah, Bono, he's a great bunch of guys. Bono balances on a tightrope of roles. He takes to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial at President Obama's inauguration and sings about Martin Luther King, whilst then offstage hounds the new president to cancel African debt. He can get his friend, Archbishop Tutu, to introduce the song One on stage at a U2 gig, using the rock and roll platform to make his adoring fans aware of the issues facing their world. He has lambasted George Bush Sr. We're quite fond of George at this point. We will rock you. He makes it easy for, uh, for us rock and roll stars because he's such an idiot. But then within a decade, he accompanied George W. to a prayer meeting. Mr. President, are you sure about this? <laughs> Encouraging conservative Americans to fund AIDS campaigns. The only time Jesus Christ is judgmental is on the subject of the poor. As you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And Bono's platform reaches millions. There is one accusation that's levelled at Bono quite a bit that I think is kind of silly, and that is that he does what he does because he loves hanging around with famous people, be they Helena Christensen or Bill Clinton or whatever. I do understand that people do have a problem when their entertainers become too politically vocal, if you like. It can rankle with people when a guy who hasn't been elected starts talking to them about the poor people of the world or whatever. $14 billion the people have pledged to the EU, but the EU hasn't found a way of spending it. But the thing about it is, quite simply, Bono has a platform, and he's always going to use it to affect change, good change, 
problem? In basic terms, he's sold millions and millions and millions of albums. He's won over 20 Grammys, and he's been nominated for Academy Awards as well. He's released some great songs, some great albums. Yeah, he is a multi-millionaire, and he does have a few houses around the world, but he's no Keith Richards slugging back to Jack Daniels in his mansions. Here's a statistic for you. Three million AIDS sufferers in Africa are on antiretroviral drugs today because of Bono. The debt of the 18 poorest countries in Africa has been cancelled because of Bono. 50 billion, that's what we're talking about now. That's the aid to Africa these days, because of Bono. He is a mouthy rock star born to be in the spotlight, but as long as that spotlight continues to shine on him, he's going to continue to mouth off, and it's that spotlight that has allowed Bono to become a global political power. And what does he do with that spotlight? He gives a voice to those who don't have one. It's like he brings everybody together. This is freedom. Look at these people together here. We are together. There's more than just the music speaking to you. Bono is unique as a rock and roll star in how he uses his voice. But he wasn't born a humanitarian pop star. A pivotal moment in Bono's career as a great crusader for the voiceless happened here in Sarm Studios in London where he and other musicians gathered on a wet Sunday in November 1984. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Coram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. This BBC News report on the famine in Ethiopia had compelled another mouthy Irishman, Bob Geldof, into co-writing a Christmas single to raise money for famine relief. This place, say workers here, is the closest thing to hell on earth. A charity record that was to become one of the biggest selling songs ever. The biggest names in music at the time gathered to record Do They Know It's Christmas? Sting, Boy George, Duran Duran, George Michael. Yet whom did Geldof give the biggest line in the song to? He gave it to Bono, but Bono wasn't exactly gnawing at the bit to sing it. Geldof hands the lyric sheet over to Bono, and Bono says, look, I'll sing any line here, but I'm not singing that line. And Geldof, in return, says, you are singing that line. In fact, that's the only reason you're here. It's a line designed to be angry, to shake people out of their apathy, to embarrass people out of their comfort zone and into action. As Bono himself said years later, it's a little man trying to carry a big idea, which kind of sums up Bono himself since then. Do They Know It's Christmas raised millions for famine relief in Ethiopia. But what was soon apparent to the campaigners was that the money they raised, though enough to buy food and medical supplies, was not sufficient to actually get the aid to the affected people. Two months ago, there were 10,000 people here. Now the latest harvest has failed, there are 40,000. There's nothing like enough food in the country, not enough transport to move it if there was. More money was needed, and rather than record another single, the idea of a massive rock concert was born, a rock and roll event on two continents. Enter Live Aid. Direct from London, a group whose heart is in Dublin, Ireland, whose spirit is with the world, a group that's never had any problems saying how they feel. You too. There are many who'd point to Bono's kind of humanitarian spark being ignited when he did Live Aid in 1985. Certainly, that seems to be the year and it went from A right through the alphabet. So U2's music had always been littered with spiritual and political themes and lyrics, but the Live Aid experience may have been the spark that lit Bono's activism. But also, it was a massive opportunity, of course, for the band, a global audience of two billion viewers across 60 countries. It was a chance to impress, a chance that Bono almost blew. Whilst performing the second song, Bono saw a girl in the audience being squashed by the crowd. He stopped singing and abandoned Larry, Adam and the Edge on stage and leapt into the audience to rescue her. By the time Bono had returned to the stage minutes later, their time was up and the band never got to finish their set. An awful lot has been made of the U2 gig at Live Aid, because when the band got off stage, 
they were freaking out, thinking it was one of the worst performances they ever gave. But the funny thing is, if you think about it, it actually points to where Bono was at the time. He kind of seized the day, he saw the moment, making the absolute enormous really intimate. And again, if you think about that, it's kind of what he's been doing ever since. Though the band thought that they had blown it, the British media chose the moment when Bono leapt off the stage as one of the highlights of Live Aid. Photos of Bono hugging the rescued girl appeared in all the papers. U2 were on their way to becoming the greatest band in the world, and Bono had not only found his voice, he now had an audience for that voice. And boy!